2022 served as a stark reminder to the general public of the pervasiveness of anti-Semitism, from Holocaust distortion to denial among prominent world leaders. In Europe, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said when referring to Hitler, quote, the most ardent anti-Semites are usually Jews, end quote. While Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban made a speech evoking Nazi racial ideology and making light of the Holocaust. In the Middle East, Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas accused Israel of committing, quote, 50 Holocausts, end quote, against the Palestinian people, while Iranian Ayatollah Khamenei referred to Zionism as, quote, a plague for the world of Islam, end quote. Even in the United States, former president and current presidential candidate Donald Trump held a dinner with Kanye West and Nick Fuentes, two infamous proponents of anti-Semitism. Hello, welcome to Decision Points. My name is David Makovsky, the Distinguished Fellow for the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and I'm glad to go on this journey through history with you. These most prominent examples of anti-Semitism are not developments confined to the upper echelons of society, but a reflection of historical hatred, the same hatred that has fueled discrimination and violence for millennia. As the FBI director, Christopher Wray, stated in 2022, quote, a full 63% of religious hate crimes are motivated by anti-Semitism, end quote. And these crimes are not confined to a specific political or social group, but must be addressed through a whole of society approach. Though anti-Semitism has persisted, there was an American perception for decades of anti-Semitism as a marginal issue, or at least more marginal than it is today. Israel, too, had an imperfect history of addressing anti-Semitism and the Holocaust in its earliest years. Upon its founding, Israel had an ethos of self-reliance that correspondingly portrayed the victims and survivors of the Holocaust as passive or weak-spirited. Moreover, many Israelis prefer the image of their state as a homeland for those who willingly move from Western free countries rather than as a haven for the persecuted. It has often been both. A pivotal moment in redirecting this narrative was the 1961 trial of Adolf Eichmann, the senior notorious Nazi official who managed and facilitated the mass deportation of millions of Jews to ghettos and killing centers in the German-occupied East. After the Mossad captured and extradited Eichmann from Argentina, Eichmann was indicted on 15 counts, including crimes against the Jewish people and crimes against humanity. The trial, held in Jerusalem, presented the testimony of Holocaust survivors and exposed the full details of the Holocaust to a global audience. Israelis themselves were captivated and shocked by the testimony of the survivors. It not only promoted a greater understanding of the Holocaust, but encouraged a younger generation of Israelis to openly discuss the atrocities. In both Israel and abroad, the continued discussion of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, as well as all forms of hatred, remained crucial. This mission to monitor and combat anti-Semitism spans across geographic boundaries and across the political spectrum. With us today is a woman who has made remembering the Holocaust and fighting anti-Semitism her life's mission. Deborah Lipstadt was the Dorot Professor of Modern Jewish History at Emory University. She has also served as the director of the Brandeis Bardeen Institute and was a research fellow at the Vidal Sassoon International Center for the Study of Anti-Semitism at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. She has written extensively on Holocaust history and was even the center of a legal case in which her legal team proved the Holocaust denial in the historiography of David Irving. Some of you may have remembered seeing the Hollywood movie. Today, Deborah Lipstadt serves as the United States Special Envoy to Monitor and Combat Anti-Semitism. She was nominated directly by President Joe Biden to spearhead the United States government's efforts to combat anti-Semitism worldwide. Deborah Lipstadt, thank you so much for joining us today. 
Thank you, David. It's great to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. It's worth asking, it seems, and maybe this is selective memory, but it seems that since World War II until now, for uh, close to 70 years, there was an assumption that anti-Semitism was somewhat at the fringes, that people understood the violent impact of anti-Semitism, and it was very much at the margins of society. So A, is that a fair assessment? And if so, why? I think it's a fair assessment, but I would rephrase it a little, put it on my wordsmithing hat. It was more on the margins of society than it is today. It was certainly there. It was sometimes it was not so much on the margins and came into more into the middle. Um, whether you're looking at the communist era, whether you're looking at certain periods here in the United States or other places, but there's definitely been a change. There's been what many people call myself included in a certain normalization of anti-Semitism in the past few years, which is very disturbing. And indeed, I think you've called it a growth industry, if I'm correct. Right. I, I work in a growth industry, or as my brother says somewhat sadly, that business is good for my sister. You know? Yeah, I'm sure it was said, you know, tongue in cheek. Bitter irony. You bitter know, irony. bitter irony, yeah. But so why are we seeing this surge now? Is it related to economic hardship? Is it related to leadership deficiencies? Is it a form of mass distraction where leaders, you know, want to have people look at other issues? Or is it just about the sheer ease of technology to reach millions of people on social media with, you know, with a tap of a button? I think all of the above. I like to say that anti-Semitism behaves, not the anti-Semite, but anti-Semitism behaves like a virus. It mutates, it adapts, it may lie quietly, but at moments of stress, it will emerge. So I think that's one of the ways of looking at this, that this is a moment of stress in many societies, of nationalism, of separatism, militism, uh, militiaism rather, economic changes. I think that's part of it. Uh, the, the extreme nationalism is part of it. And I think also that a big, ma- a major part is that there's a delivery system today. When I first started working on Holocaust denial, if you wanted denial material, you had to go to the archives of an organization or a library that collected the stuff. Today, you just go on the internet and in, in a nanosecond, Mrs. Google gives you all sorts of things to ch- select from. So it's a lot of those things. And anti-Semitism is also a slippery slope. So the anti-Semite who engages in it, if they see they get traction, if he or she or whomever sees that they get traction, uh, they'll push back a little more. They'll increase. So it never quite stops, but it's that snowball running down the hill. I just, I mean, I just, as we're talking, I'm thinking the FBI director, I think was quoted as saying, anti-Semitism is unique that it's, the Jews are kind of catching it from both ends. I guess he means from the right and the left edge of the spectrum. And yet, that's right, that's right. It must be from, you know, for different reasons. Oh, there's that famous story that in the communist period, the Jews are called capitalists. In the capitalist period, they're called communists. They're always like the other in this way, what was considered, you know, the primal sin in these countries. But you know, you're hitting on a number of things. First of all, anti-Semitism is a prejudice. And think about the etymology of the word prejudice, prejudge. Don't confuse me with the facts I've made up my mind. You know, how can a Jew be a capitalist and a communist at the same time? How can a Jew be pushy? Jews are pushy. They want to get into clubs that don't want them. Or Jews are clannish. They stick together and they don't allow others in. You can't be all those things at the same time. And yet the anti-Semite argues that because it's a prejudice and prejudices are not logical. So that's certainly a major part of it. I also think that it's as Christopher Ray, the FBI director, was saying in his Senate testimony of couple of weeks ago, is that it's ubiquitous. It comes from every place on the political spectrum. It comes from Christians. It comes from Muslims. It comes from atheists. It comes from Jews. You know, now when I say it comes from every place on the political spectrum, there will be listeners who will say, no, 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 it's much worse on the right. And that may be as of the moment. And that may indeed be correct. More of what we're seeing, whether it's what we saw in Germany uh, uh, 10 days ago or so with the arrest of these people who were trying to overthrow the German government, 
whether we what we saw on, on January 6th, what we see in some of the social media platforms, that is definitely coming from the separatist, nationalist, militia kind of groups. But it comes from other places as well. Is it always the same threat? No, of course not. But if you travel to the UK, or I know you read the UK papers, and I know you were there, uh, during the years of the Labour Party under Corbyn, you saw hostile, hostile, virulently hostile anti-Semitism from the left. So I hate getting into the what aboutism, you know, well, if you say it's on the right, what about the left? If you say it's on the left, what about? I'm not, I'm not interested in that. I'm going to call it out wherever I see it. And I'm going to call it out. I'm going to say it's different threats, but none of it is good. Now, the Arab world seems to be an unusual place. I mean, you, you know, dedicated time. I mean, you, you've made trips there and you've met with the leadership. I mean, that also seems like something in flux. I mean, in that we've always talked about the anti-Semitism in the Arab media and all these years. And now some of these Arab governments unclear about the peoples yet, but the governments are trying to find new common ground with Israel. Do you see more hope here on the Arab world based on your trips? Based on my trips, based on my conversations here in Washington with officials from these various Gulf countries, based on my reading you know, of their media and, and our media, I'm very hopeful. Now, you made a very important point, and the, the irony of you're asking me about this, because before I take these trips, I call you and I talk to you about them. But the irony of you're asking me about this is that what you say correctly, we see it so far amongst the governments. We see it to a certain level on the street, but we don't yet see it enough on the street. Uh, I believe during the FIFA competitions, FIFA competitions in Qatar, there was a great degree of hostility towards Israeli reporters, towards Israeli soccer fans from people from some of these Gulf countries. One hopes that it will trickle down, that they, that it will reach the people. In something like this, with a change like this, it's really got to start from the top. But we hope that it continues down. And if you look at, you know, someone who's, who's favored Israeli-Palestinian coexistence, you know, you can't but be, to say disappointed is a mild word, but angry, I would say, about a statement in Berlin by PA President Mahmoud Abbas saying that Israel's committed 50 holocausts. And to what extent do you see statements like this as a way of being used politically by these leaders to connect with certain constituencies, the timing, the location of such statements. Plus' statement, he did, I don't think he said Israel committed. He, when they asked him about the Munich Olympics, because he was coming up on the anniversary, and he was in the, I think he was speaking in the Bundestag with the uh, German chancellor. Yeah, he was standing at the same podium. Yeah, That's right. He was asked about it and he said, don't talk to me about that. I can talk about 50 Holocaust. I believe it was August. I had just come back, in fact, from my travels. And we immediately, you know, this is diplomacy by tweet, but that's how a lot of things get out there. We immediately drafted a comment very much uh, decrying it and put it through the clearance process because these things it's just not Deborah Lipstadt talking. When I speak, I'm speaking in the name of the United States State Department and so facto American foreign policy. Uh, we cleared it in the building with the various desks that would be directly involved and put out a statement saying that this kind of Holocaust distortion, it's not denial, but it's distortion, which is dangerous, can lead to anti-Semitism. Retweeted it. But to go back to the essence of your question, those kind of comments are not useful at all. They don't further the peace process, however weak and anemic it might be. They don't do anything but inculcate suspicion in the minds and hearts of Israelis and hostility in the minds and hearts of Palestinians. Now, asking you more as an, an academic who has spent your whole professional life studying uh, the Holocaust, anti-Semitism, you know, you have a great sweep of history in looking at the relationship between Israel and the Holocaust. And 
there was a sense that Israel didn't always want to focus too much on this issue. Maybe they liked the idea of a Jewish state more as a homeland for the better off than a haven for the persecuted. Of course, they understood that that was their raison d'etre, to be a haven and not just a homeland. But Israel had a certain, uh, it seems like a complex relationship, ambiguous. So how, yeah, cause help us out with this, because it doesn't sound intuitive. Well, you know where I encountered it and got a chance to study it more? In my book on the Eichmann trial. Because the Eichmann trial is really a turning point in how Israel relates to the Shoah. And then I've encountered it again. I just finished a book for Yale, which will be published in their Jewish Live series in the coming calendar year. And of course, I encountered it. It's a biography of Golda Meir. You encounter it very much because you watch her during those years of the Shoah. Israel had a and has, but even had previously a, a very complex attitude or sentiment or uh, towards the Shoah. First of all, you know, the Sabra, the Israeli, saw himself, herself as the Jew who was a victim in the Shoah. And, you know, you know what the slang was for Sabonim, Sabonim, and then it became a soap. Sabon. Sabon means soap, and Sabonim are soaps people who would be into soaps. And by the way, I, I mentioned that recently, and a young man came up to me, was uh, just had finished a service in Sal, and said in his unit, I don't know if it's universal across Sal, that still when someone doesn't care, when you feel someone is not carrying their weight, when you feel someone is being a slacker or afraid or something, you say, come on, don't be a sabon. Because um, the, hor- the horrific, uh, gruesome thing here is that during the Holocaust, you know, people... They thought Jews were made, the the idea was, the notion was that Jews were made into soap, which turned out not to be true, but that was what it meant. And the Sabra thought of himself or herself as the epitome. We weren't the ghetto Jews who let themselves be led to, that was the notion, that was the concept. The Israeli had an ethos of self-reliance. Right. And and that self-reliance really would ensure that they would never be lambs to the slaughter, so to speak, the way they wanted to depict the Jews who were killed in the Holocaust. Right, exactly. And I think that what happened in part beginning to a great extent with the Eichmann trial, where the prosecutor, Gideon Hausner, called, I think he called 103 witnesses of which whom, of whom 97 were uh, survivors of the Holocaust. And they gave testimony. And, you know, Israelis saw and heard people who were very much like them. They weren't, uh, they were young people. They were people who had built new lives, et cetera. And they began to understand more clearly. It didn't happen overnight with the Ashman trial. It took a long time, but there but for fortune go you or I. That the Holocaust was a matter of geographic and chronological good fortune as much as anything else. Um, and they, what they also ignored the fact was that in the wake of the Shoah, during Mohammed Tashikhor, during the War of Independence, uh, many of the people who were fighting were people who got off the boat and were taken directly to given arms and directly started fighting. So a lot of them were Holocaust survivors. The only group that fared better right from the outset in Israel, the Israeli mythos about the Holocaust, not myth, but, but sort of view and all comprehensive view were the resistance fighters. The resistance fighters were the people who did right. They stood up as we would have stood up. But that begins to change. It begins to change, as I say, during the Eichmann trial and in the wake of that, with a new generation, with a generation um, that begins to understand that it was not so much that these people, there was that it was not that there was anything wrong with these people, but who were victims, but it's the time and the circumstance. You know who captures this very well? Chaim Guri, in his book on the Ashman trial, he was writing sketches, short pieces uh, from the trial for an Israeli newspaper, and he writes these very powerful sketches about his reaction and watching people's reactions to the witnesses, and that that captures that very well. So there's no, they use the word condescension. In your view, starting with the Eichmann trial, that starts to go away. And by the way, I just want to say what you mentioned about the Holocaust survivors with the guns in their hands. You know, when I wrote my book with Dennis Ross on Israeli leaders who made a difference, and you look at Rabin and Sharon, were both 
had a latrine connection. The fact that these Holocaust survivors survived Auschwitz and yet had no training and just had a gun, a rifle put in their arms and then are killed, it both it motivates both of them to make a career out of the military because they realize it can't be that you could survive the death camps and be killed in the Middle East. I think those battles had a huge impact on both of those two individuals. I think that's very true. And I remember that in your book, and it's very powerful. But it begins to change. I think what also, sadly, very sadly, helps change it is over the years of the 70s and into even the 80s, when you had Israelis be taken hostage, you know, whether it was Entebbe or whether it was a bus or a school or whatever, and you had, you know, two, three, four terrorists taking them. Some Israelis became a little more modest in their judgment, you know? Yeah. I think if in the early years, if, I don't know if you think this is a fair assessment to say, look, in the early years, the, a message of the Holocaust is stateless Jews are defenseless Jews. And I think people still think that. But I also think they come to the view that self-reliance is necessary, but it's not sufficient. You need allies in this world. You can't be isolated. You, The world is a complicated place. And you can have a Jewish state, but if you don't have alliances, you're vulnerable. And I, 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 I agree with you 100% on both those points. I fear that there are some people who very much take the first point, that a Jew without a state is a vulnerable Jew, but forget about the alliance piece. Okay, so we're taping this at the, at the end of 2022. I just, maybe just to look back and look forward, you know, what gives you hope? If you could talk about the Middle East, because we're a podcast that deals with Israel and the Middle East, based on your trips about the future, and also just reflect on a kind of a status report that it's clear that you're someone who the administration values a lot and is a very high profile member of this administration to deal with an issue where it has just come out, there's going to be a new interagency process given the spike in anti-Semitism. So I guess, you know, what are you most proud of and how do you see going forward in terms of the goals ahead? Well, I'm very proud of First of all, being asked by the president to take this job. And, you know, some people thought I was nuts. Here I am after a very storied and blessed career in academia. I was at the senior rank. I had an academic chair. I taught three courses a year, two of which were seminars. I had research assistants to help me with my research, marking papers and other things. And I thought that was a full-time job. You know, <laughs> And so people said to me, Deborah, why are you doing this now? Uh, and, and I began to think, do I really want to do this now? Shortly after I got the call from the White House, I said to a friend, I'm not sure. A friend here in Washington, she said, Deborah, you have to do it. I said, why? She said, because you can make a difference. So that was the end. I stopped. When someone says that to you, you can make a difference. You know, what better epitaph do we want than you made a difference? Now, I'm not sure I'm making such a great difference because a uh, terrible irony, since I came into office, Situation has only gotten worse, but I said that to someone recently, and they said, no, no, Deborah, you're missing the point. If you hadn't been off in office, it would be even worse. So I think that's what Israelis would call chatsi nechama, half a conversation. In any case, what gives me hope? First of all, the developments in the Gulf, even though they haven't yet translated down Certainly when I was in Morocco, there, the Moroccans sort of, as you well know, and I think you may have even reminded me before I went, the Moroccans don't talk about the Abraham Accords. They talk about normalization or renormalization. So I met with a group of at hotel school, the largest hotel school in Africa in Tangiers. I met with a group of people tr- who are tour guides who are now learning Hebrew in order to be tour guides for anticipated Israeli tourists particularly of Moroccan heritage, because those are the ones who are anxious to come there. In fact, on my first day there in Casablanca, we went to the mosque, and then from the mosque, we went to the museum adjacent to the mosque. And as I was walking into the museum, a a woman in front of me, I'd say in her 50s, something like that, I heard a a word or two of Hebrew. So I said to her, I said, are you from Morocco? She said, Safta. 
my grandmother, was from Maknes. I think Maknes is that in Morocco. I may be mispronouncing it. So I said, she said, it's my first time here. I'll say it in Hebrew, then I'll translate it. Hamakom hazet, she pointed to her heart, midaberli la lev. This place speaks to my heart. And she said it with tears in her eyes. So there's a very strong connection there uh, that goes further down, I think, than in some of the other countries. But if you had told me that my first trip would be to Saudi Arabia, my first stop would be to Saudi Arabia, that I would be going to UAE, that I, the Bahrainis are just waiting for me to come and to Morocco and get such a warm and positive welcome. They know what I was coming for. It wasn't like I was coming just plain old ambassador with no remit. And they said, well, let me talk about anti They knew why I was there. And I got this very positive welcome. It doesn't mean they aren't focused on the Israeli-Palestinian crisis. They're very much focused on that. But they're beginning to recognize that the two can be separated. The attitude towards Jews and, and the attitude on the Middle East are not one and the same. It seems like a once in a generational moment. You know, it's one thing when you talk to uh, kind of insider constituencies, they could talk about, you know, uh, commonality of, of interests. Uh, you get this uh, transactionally from Israel and high tech, or you get this economically. But when you're talking to your public, you've got to make a case in terms not just in, about common interests, but common values. And the idea of both being all the children of Abraham in a certain way, it, it seems like this, and maybe not just once in one generation, once in five, 10, 20 generational moment, that this could be lead to a new societal discourse, not just between Israelis and Gulf states, Israelis and Morocco, but between Jews and Muslims writ large. So how do you seize the moment to widen the aperture in a broad way? What you're saying is exactly what I feel. It was one of the reasons I chose to start in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia for many years, and again, you know this even better than I, was the purveyor of a great deal of anti-Semitism throughout the world, certainly in the European continent, North America, other South America, other places. They would send out imams who would preach, you know, Jews are cats, Jews are monkeys, whatever, I don't think they sent them out with the remit. Now go and say to your constituents, to your congregations, Jews are monkeys. But if they said it, that was fine, especially since they were doing it outside the kingdom, etc. And we know many of those who Muslims who did terrible things, terrorist acts, etc. Many of them were radicalized or, or were more radicalized, made more radical in these mosques by imams funded by Gulf countries, including Saudi Arabia. So when they are willing to talk about this, I'm not whitewashing their human rights record, just like I'm not white, whitewashing America's human rights record. But I will go anywhere and talk to anyone who is serious about who I feel or I've been I've given the indication or convinced or my colleagues tell me that they're serious about talking about anti-Semitism. If they're serious about doing this, then I'm willing to talk to them. Because I very much believe, I think it was the New Yorker who described it as trickle-down human rights. If they stop othering one group, maybe they'll stop othering other groups. If they stop othering Jews, maybe others will stop othering Jews, you know, making Jews other, etc. So that gave me great hope. That Am I Pollyannish that all is fixed and all is terrific? No. But am I convinced that there's room there. There's possibility for achievement there. I think there is. Look, I met in Saudi Arabia with a number of young people, people in their 30s, working at newspapers, NGOs, entrepreneurs, who very much are anxious to get on with it. And these attitudes are attitudes of the past. Now, let's hope that the Middle East doesn't explode and, you know, set back a lot of these sentiments in this work. So I guess my last question, Deborah, is this, to talk about the peoples, for those who are anxious in our country, here in the United States, who've always seen this, you know, the country of all the great liquid assets, the Pacific and, and the Atlantic, not having any of the old style, you know, whether it's a religious anti-Semitism, nothing like Europe in a certain way. And given that celebrities are saying certain things and posting certain things and even comedians might be saying certain things, people wonder, 
what's changing here in our country? Yeah, because I think you have this unique unique role, and I'm not uh, trying to flatter you, but you're seen as someone who's very authentic, whose whole life has been based on trying to combat this and and remember the Holocaust, fight anti-Semitism, people trust you. You know, I'm seeing in your office the, the line from the book of Esther, you know, who knows if for a moment like this, you've risen to a place of authority would be a loose translation, I guess. But uh, would be the exact words, I think, in Hebrew. But people wonder, what can Deborah Lipstadt, Ambassador Deborah Lipstadt, tell me that America is not changing in front of my eyes and could give me some reassurance about the future for my kids and my grandchildren? You know, we spend now a lot of time and energy on anti-Semitism, as we should, because it's, you know, with the internet, you talk about the oceans, liquid assets, liquid protections, the internet goes right across that and dissolves those. But what I would say, and in fact, I was privileged in between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur to be on a phone call with President of the United States, with President Biden, and 1,200 rabbis. He, every year when he was vice president, he would do this kind of thing, and he continues it now as president. And he spoke with them, and then I was uh, stayed on to answer questions. And one of the questions I got was, what gives you joy? And I think that what gives me joy is, is separate and apart from my job. My job is not my, the things I deal with in my job and in my research and my teaching. It's not just the job. I'm the, I've had very, very talented and very, very good predecessors, but I, I think I'm the first one who came with uh, 30 years of working and teaching and writing about this, which was a gutsy choice on the part of the president because professors are very Im- unpredictable. But what gives me joy and what gives me the ability to do what I do is all the positive stuff about Judaism, all the affirming kind of things. Last night, we're talking in the a couple of days before Hanukkah, I was invited to a Hanukkah party at the Library of Congress sponsored by Debbie Wasserman Schultz, represent Debbie Wasserman Schultz and some of her colleagues. And in the room next door, the Library of Congress had laid out with no protection. I was a little amazed, but I was so pleased to get a close look at them, uh, some of the Judaica treasures from their collection. And I was went over and I suddenly got all excited. There was a Mishnah Torah, one of the famous series of books of 14 volumes by Rambam by Maimonides, open to his Hilchot Tshuva, to his laws of repentance, which I find are brilliant and which I often study before Rosh Hashanah, before Yom Kippur. And I was so excited and a rabbi walked in and he was walked over to ask me something. And before he could, I said, look, 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 it's, it's Rambam Silcho Tshuva. I said, look, here it is right in front of us, open the 10th chapter. It's the shortest chapter, but where he brings it together and he moves more philosophically. And this rabbi's mouth it just was looking at me with both joy and amazement. Because here was the person who was assigned to do all the fighting against the Jew haters. And what was getting me excited was seeing this Jewish text. If I didn't have that, if I didn't have that as a resource, I don't think I could do this job. So what I would say to your listeners is even as they worry about anti-Semitism, as they should, and even as they concern themselves to try to fight it, as they should, that shouldn't become the raison d'etre, the reason for their Jewish identity. And the story I like to tell, in fact, the story I told last night when I was given a chance to say a few words is, I reminded people there that there was on Motzei Shabbat, on Saturday night, many of us, after we'd say Havdalah, sing Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet, because Elijah the prophet is associated with the end of Shabbat, because when Elijah will come, the Messianic age, as Jews see it, all our days will be like one long Shabbat. But there's a line, as we sing, we say, even though even though he may tarry, nonetheless, I believe. And it's said that there were even Jews during the Holocaust who sang that during their darkest moments. I think that the the challenge to us is not to become, because of anti-Semitism Jews, but to become Afalpi Jews, Afalpi Chain, to become despite, despite those efforts, despite all the negative stuff, we stay strong, we identify because of all the positive stuff or the legacy, the ancient legacy, the traditions, and that it is who we are. 
and how much it is given to the world. You know, every once in a while I go to the National Archives to visit the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Two documents that are heavily steeped in, in Hebrew scriptures, you know, and so many others, that that's what should motivate us. And we should be, uh, yes, concerned about anti-Semitism, but identifying not because of, but afalpi, despite. And just to add a note to this, which you may know, that one of the ships of the Mapilim, the Jews who snuck into the Yishuv, into then Palestine, in the years immediately after the Shoah, after the Holocaust, one of the ships was called the Afal Pichain. So you're saying, remember why you're in this. You're in it for the affirmation of a long history and a, a rich culture that you think is resonant with a lot of meaning, and not just for the past, but for the future. And don't be just an anti-anti-Semite. That's right. That may get your juices flowing, that may bring you to the barricades, but you should know how Jews lived and not just how they were attacked and not just how they died. You should know what Judaism stands for and not just what the anti-Semite says against it. Well, that really contextualizes things for us. And I just want to thank you so much, Ambassador Deborah Lipstadt, for your time and wish you that you go from strength to strength in this important position at the State Department as you represent the United States around the world in dealing with a certain menace, but having those convictions, it seems to me that uh, that gives you the staying power, you know, the stamina to keep at it. So I just want to thank you so much. Thank you, David. And thank you for the work you do. You've been a friend, a compatriot, and a quiet advisor and informant on so many things. And I so appreciate our connection. Anti-Semitism is the ancient scourge of prejudice and discrimination. Jews have been its victims for millennia, and the Holocaust was its ultimate manifestation. Israel was not founded because of the Holocaust, but it was the ultimate reminder that stateless Jews were defenseless Jews. Ben-Gurion and other early Zionist leaders saw it as their ultimate failure, that they did not have a state in the 1930s and early 1940s, This meant the Jewish community of Palestine was powerless to prevent the worst tragedy in history. As Deborah Lipstadt noted in our interview, Jews were always called the other. They were denounced as communists in capitalist society, and they were denounced as capitalists in communist society. Just to give a couple of examples, amid all the bad news of 2022, however, there is some good news, as now some Arab governments are starting to commemorate the Holocaust that their leaderships and state-owned media denied vociferously for many decades. There is not just Holocaust commemorations in these countries, but the United Arab Emirates has just announced that it is incorporating the teaching of the Holocaust in its school system. When Deborah Lipstadt talks about combating anti-Semitism, she said in our interview that it should never be the sum of identity to be anti-anti-Semites, focusing not just on rooting out hatred. Identity is formed based on a wide variety of factors, including affirming the experience of culture, religion, language, history, and coexistence. As we search for the balance that Lipstadt offers, it requires vigilance to remember the hatred of the past so it is never repeated again against Jews or against any other people. Thank you for listening to another episode of Decision Points. I want to thank all of our listeners from all over the world. I hope you listen to all of season four and to all previous seasons. You can find Decision Points on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts, as well as on the Washington Institute website. Download and subscribe to never miss an episode. While you're there, please leave us a review and rating and tell your friends. I want to thank all those who made this podcast possible. Our coordinators, Gabriel Epstein, David Patkin, and Jonah Schrock, and our researchers, Valeria De La Fuente and Stuart Harris. I also want to thank Jeff Rubin, Scott Rogers, Carolina Krauskopf, and Maria Rodacci of the Washington Institute. And finally, Adrian Bain, our producer, and Richard Myron from Earshot Strategies. Thank you all.